Today I'll be talking about some miscellaneous topics in electrophysiology. The learning objectives will be to recognize examples of overdrive suppression, to define and recognize basic examples of concealed conduction, and last, to explain the excitable gap and entrainment. Please be aware that these objectives, particularly the second and third one, cover very advanced and complicated topics. The intricate details of the phenomena of concealed conduction and entrainment would take hours to present and are typically the domain of electrophysiologists. I'll just be introducing the concepts so that they are familiar to you if encountered while reading the primary literature or cardiology textbook. And this video will assume you're already familiar with the concepts presented in the video on mechanisms of tachyarrhythmias. First up is the simplest of these topics, overdrive suppression. You may recall that the heart is filled with latent pacemakers, tiny collections of cells which experience a slow, intrinsic, spontaneous depolarization and which can take over the heart's native rhythm if faster pacemakers fail. Normally, these faster pacemakers, for example the sinus node, suppress the slower latent pacemakers as a simple consequence of triggering their depolarization more quickly than their natural intrinsic rate. However, when the latent pacemakers are depolarized at a faster rate than their intrinsic rate, increased activity of the sodium-potassium pump results in hyperpolarization of the membrane and temporary antagonism of phase 4 depolarization. Overdrive suppression refers to the situation in which there is a temporary quiescent period within the sinus node and or latent pacemakers immediately after a faster, suppressive rhythm has stopped. For example, consider the following rhythm strip. In the first third of the strip, there is a regular narrow complex tachycardia at a rate of about 150 as a consequence of a reentrant rhythm such as AVNRT. Then the reentrant rhythm abruptly stops. Perhaps it was a spontaneous block in one limb of the reentrant circuit, or maybe the patient performed a valsalva maneuver or received a nodal blocking medication. It's impossible to tell just from the strip. But notice what happens after the tachyarrhythmia terminates. There's nothing. The patient has no electrical activity from the sinus node or anywhere else for over two seconds before the sinus node restarts at a rate of about 60. The failure of the sinus node to pick up the rhythm immediately is a consequence of overdrive suppression. When prolonged, a post-tachycardia pause can result in syncope in circumstances in which the tachycardia itself would not. Thus, the overdrive suppression-related pause may actually be more dangerous than the primary arrhythmia. Normally, overdrive suppression affects subsidiary pacemakers more than the sinus node. Clinically significant overdrive suppression of the sinus node, as seen in this example, may imply some degree of sinus node dysfunction and is a major component of the tachycardia-bradycardia variant of six sinus syndrome. In addition, overdrive suppression has minimal effect on abnormal automaticity as compared to latent pacemakers. Therefore, what appears to be a normal escape beat occurring during a relatively short sinus pause may actually be an example of abnormal automaticity as the latent pacemakers would likely still be experiencing suppression. The next topic is concealed conduction. Most electrophysiological activity within the heart is visible on the 12-lead EKG. Concealed conduction refers to penetration of an electrical impulse into a specific cardiac structure which is not immediately apparent from the surface EKG, that is, it produces no identifiable waveform. However, its existence can be inferred by its effects on subsequent visible electrical activity. The most common site where the effects of concealed conduction manifest is the AV node. For example, when a proximal atrial impulse traveling antegrade reaches the AV node, but it does not continue distally to result in ventricular depolarization due to the his purkinje system still being within the refractory period. There are dozens, perhaps hundreds of different ways in which concealed conduction can manifest on the EKG. I'll show just two examples to demonstrate the variety. First, a relatively common and straightforward one, and then a rarer, substantially more complicated one. First, consider this rhythm strip. We have what appears to be normal sinus rhythm with a rate of 60 beats per minute 
and there are two PVCs. These are a special kind of PVC called an interpolated PVC, which means that it occurs early enough after the preceding sinus beat that the subsequent sinus beat is still conducted. In other words, there is no large disruption of the underlying sinus rhythm. However, look carefully at the PR intervals. For most of the sinus beats, the PR interval is about 180 milliseconds. However, for the sinus beats that come after the two PVCs, the PR is longer, about 310 milliseconds. So is this patient developing intermittent first degree AV block? No. What's occurring here is that a retrograde impulse from the PVC is traveling up the Hisperkinji system back into the AV node where partial depolarization takes place, but the impulse ends there. It does not continue into the atria or back to the sinus node. So the next sinus beat and P wave occurs on time, but when that impulse reaches the AV node, it's still partially refractory from the preceding PVC. Thus, there is a greater delay in the antegrade sinus beats forward propagation, which manifests on the EKG as transient PR prolongation. The penetration into the AV node of that retrograde impulse from the PVC is referred to as concealed because its existence can only be inferred by subsequent electrical activity, in this case a prolongation of the PR interval. This form of concealed conduction, while not necessarily an everyday phenomenon, is not particularly uncommon. In contrast, consider this significantly more complicated strip. If you're looking to challenge yourself, feel free to pause the video here and try to work out on your own what's happening. First, what underlying rhythm is this patient experiencing? It's narrow complex with a rate of around 65 to 70 beats per minute. The QRS complexes are not preceded by a P wave and if you look carefully, you'll see a subtle retrograde P wave at the beginning of the ST segment immediately after the QRS complex. There are a couple of different synonymous terms for this rhythm, but in the US, it's most commonly referred to as an accelerated junctional rhythm. There's nothing particularly special or unusual about most accelerated junctional rhythms, but if you look at this one more carefully, you notice something interesting. The rate is not constant. The RR interval, that is, the distance between adjacent QRS complexes is typically 860 milliseconds, except for two intervals, which are 1,020 milliseconds. That's a little odd, as accelerated junctional rhythms are typically pretty regular. And then look at the so-called RP interval, that is, the time from the start of the QRS complex and the start of the subsequent retrograde P wave. Most of the time, it's about 90 milliseconds. However, the RP interval that is contained within the unusually long RR intervals is also longer, about 150 milliseconds, with the retrograde P waves occurring at the end of the ST segment, just before the T wave begins. So what's going on here? This patient has dual AV nodal pathways, just as in a patient with AV NRT. There's a pathway that conducts quickly and one which conducts slowly. And in this case, the ectopic junctional focus is distal to the rejoining of those two pathways. With each wave of depolarization that originates from the junctional focus, it travels quickly up the fast pathway and slowly up the slow pathway, such that the atrial side of the slow pathway has already been depolarized and is now refractory before the impulse traveling through the slow pathway reaches the atria. And at the same time, the depolarization wavefront moves distally from the junctional focus to depolarize the ventricles. This gives us a narrow QRS complex followed immediately by a retrograde P from the retrograde uh, wavefront traveling up the fast pathway. If this is all that was going on, this would look indistinguishable on EKG from a patient with the same junctional rhythm, but without dual AV nodal pathways. What happens in this case, however, is that occasionally, for some reason, there is block of the fast pathway. Now the atrial side of the slow pathway is not refractory when it's reached by the impulse traveling retrograde through the slow pathway, which is then responsible for continuing on upwards through the atria, resulting in the retrograde P. And if the slow pathway is just slow enough, and the refractory period of the fast pathway is just short enough, the impulse that originally traveled back up the slow pathway can loop back down the fast pathway, all the way back to the junctional focus, 
the junctional focus then gets depolarized and reset, so to speak. However, the distal Hisperkinji tissues may still be refractory, preventing propagation all the way to the ventricles, and thus preventing a premature QRS complex. The net result is a longer RP interval since the retrograde impulse made its way back to the atria via the slow pathway rather than the fast one. In addition, since the junctional focus was reset shortly after its spontaneous discharge, that particular RR interval ends up being a little longer. It's that extra depolarization of the junctional focus which is concealed, which must occur about 160 milliseconds after the preceding discharge in order to account for the specific lengthening of the RR interval. And since the underlying junctional rhythm didn't require the dual AV nodal pathways for propagation, they were just a bystander, so to speak, the intermittent block of the fast pathway doesn't terminate the rhythm. The next cycle occurs just a little bit later, but otherwise acts just like it did before. Now, please do not feel bad if you did not see that. That was an extremely challenging example. Uh, even experienced Stanford EP faculty needed a few minutes to sort that one out. Next, I'll discuss the excitable gap. As you presumably know, in a reentrant circuit, there is a wavefront of depolarization traveling around in a circle, sort of chasing its tail, firing off antigrade impulses in one direction and retrograde impulses in another with each cycle. The excitable gap is the region of myocardium that exists after the tail of one depolarization wavefront, but before the oncoming head of the next wavefront. Excitable gaps can be composed of fully recovered myocardium, partially recovered myocardium, or a mixture of both. The larger the excitable gap, the more likely an extra stimulus can terminate a reentrant rhythm, and the more likely the rhythm can be entrained. Entrainment is a process by which well-timed invasive pacing can speed up a reentrant rhythm with a return to the rhythm's previous rate upon abrupt cessation of pacing. Consider this rhythm strip, which was recorded in the EP lab with catheters and electrical wires inside the patient's heart. This patient is experiencing a regular wide complex tachycardia with no discernible P waves, thus ventricular tachycardia. In this case, the VT's intrinsic rate is about 137 beats per minute, which is what is seen at the beginning of the strip. Then the electrophysiologist starts pacing the patient at a just slightly faster rate. Initially, there is no effect on the underlying VT. It remains at 137 beats per minute. But then as the faster pacing spikes occur earlier and earlier in the intrinsic cardiac cycle, they suddenly capture the rhythm and the heart begins to beat at that ever so slightly faster rate. After a few seconds, the pacing is stopped and the VT resumes its prior rate of 137. During the period of time when the ventricle is paced faster than the intrinsic VT rate, the rhythm is said to have been entrained. The ability of a rhythm to be entrained can be helpful in both confirming a reentrant mechanism of an arrhythmia, as well as mapping it prior to ablation. That concludes this video on advanced EKGs with some miscellaneous topics in electrophysiology. Please feel free to leave questions and comments below.